Good morning. All right. Um, <clears throat> our lesson today, we're uh, getting near the end of the book here. Um, but uh, we're still looking at faith. Uh, if you look on page um, 143 there, that's our lesson beginning. And uh, this, uh, this lesson is about, about worrying and why, what the difference is between being faithful and being uh, worrisome. And this is uh, in Luke, uh, Luke 12. We start in verse 22 in the Bible. And this is where Jesus is giving instruction to his disciples about worry. And um, letting them know that uh, there's, a, there's a way to confront things that will try to worry you in the world and a way to um, overcome that. So what, uh, what things are, am I afraid of? What, what things do I worry about? What things do I have anxiety about? And that's a word that we sometimes use a lot, right? Anxiety means just to be uneasy or even fearful. But we have to ask ourselves, then, where, where then are we focusing our attention on the things that we're worried about, which are going to come and go and come again and go, or the things that are God's, the treasures in heaven. Where's your mind? Where's your focus? If we put our eyes on a greater place, a greater goal, then we won't be constantly focused on worrying. We won't be constantly looking for a different place to put our attention, keep our attention on the treasures in heaven. And that doesn't mean to ignore earthly concerns. We've got to live in the world. We've got to endure the things the world brings upon us, right? But when you're born again, you've got to remember what, what's been said. You are not of this world. We're different, transformed. And there's no use at all then in worry, being worried and, and, and anxious and, and, and anxious and, and anguishing over all the things that the world brings upon you because we have a comfort that only those who know God can have, the comfort of an, a heavenly home. So let's pray and we'll get into these, these verses. Lord God, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for the ability to come together to study your word. And I ask, Father, today that uh, you'll give me the, uh, the ability to just say everything that you need me to say, to get myself out of the way so that you might have the Holy Spirit come through to be our teacher today and let us know everything that you would have us know. And I pray that there's someone here today that needs to hear exactly what is said today and that our study will enlighten all of us, that we can take what we learn here today and out into the world to make ourselves better soldiers for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's look at the first part. This is Luke 12, 22. And Jesus has um, <clears throat> confronted uh, previously um, a man that is concerned with his inheritance and things like that and his worldly wealth. So Jesus has turned then to the <laughs> disciples and he, he gives a lesson. And it starts in verse 22 here. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are you better than the fowls? And which of you with taking thought can add one, to add to his stature one cubit? If you then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take your thought for the rest? But Jesus turns to the disciples here. He knows that there's a time coming for these people, these, these disciples of his, that they're going to be tested. They're going to be uh, confronted with an opportunity to be worried, to be anxious. But he's talking to us too, warning against covetousness, greed, clinging to worldly things. If you look at Philippians 4 and 6, this is uh, echoed pretty well. It says, uh, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we see here that, that there is a one-to-one a -one going together of trusting in God and your worry going away. The more we trust in God, the more our worry goes away. And that's in Philippians 4 and 7, that's called the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Because in the earthly realm, people can't understand 
what that what that that power is your worries don't go away until you deal with them they just get bigger and bigger right but worries to us we can give to god and we know that he will address them we don't have to worry about things like that we trust him to give us everything that we need and we we put our cast our cares on him it's first peter 5 7 cast all your care upon him for he careth for you and that cares you know that's that's um Something that's that's good for God. You know, we have two different ways to think about caring. You know, where you have if you have cares, that means you're worried, right? But to care for someone means to have a concern for them. God has that for you. God has concern for you. God cares for you, and God is willing to take your worries to Himself and take care of them. In fact, worry and faith it's almost an opposite thing. They can't go together. We have the promise from Jesus that God's going to provide all you need. Now God's not going to provide all that you want, but trusting in his provision will give you faith to overcome that worry, that anxiety. And we see in verse 23, Jesus says, life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. So this is a rebuttal to all those who, who say this. And there were people around in Jesus' time that, that there, we, human beings were just a physical body. We're just a biological machine. That our only concern should be eating good food and drinking wine and enjoying ourselves. And I talked a while back about this Greek philosopher, Epicurus, who, uh, who denied the existence of God. He was one of these also who said that your body is just a machine, and then when you die, you're just gone, and there's nothing you can concern yourself but worry, but, but worldly things. And he had that same philosophy, and that's the philosophy that Jesus has just talked about in this parable. If you go a little ways back into Luke 22 and 21, that verse... Talking about this man that had, had built up these, these storehouses for all of the fruit that he had, all of the wealth that he had on earth. And he says in Luke twenty two twenty one, And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. That's that kind of attitude. There's no other concern but the worldly concern. But you know, you can't, you can't be merry in those things except for a very small amount of time. Eating good food is pleasurable, but overeating brings you health problems. Drinking wine and alcohol damages your judgment, gets you in all kinds of trouble. These things are not what you were created to partake in. We're here to worship God and do the things that he desires. And when we say that, that, that the body is more than meat and more than clothes, raiment, that's a promise we have. You know, if I had, didn't have anything to eat, if I was skinny as a rail, um, nothing but rags to wear, I didn't have any shoes or socks, God would still say, call me his son. He would still invite me to his altar. He would still invite me to his throne. He would still have a garment of white linen for me, waiting. That's the wisdom of God that, that can give us that gift, dispel our worries, because you can take comfort in that, that that is the truth. You're not just another face in the crowd. God has a concern for you. You are known by him, loved by him. That's God Almighty we're talking about. That's the creator of the universe. You're desired by him. His spirit seeks after you. His eyes are looking for ways to be strong for you. We, we see this from the, from the Bible. So you are known by God. You don't have to worry about things the world has. Look how small the things of the world are in comparison to the Almighty God who is in your corner, who is waiting and looking for a way to be strong for you. So don't worry about those things. And when things come to you in the world and say, you've got to worry about this, you know their lies then, don't you? You know their lies. And he says in verse 24, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. So the first thing that uh, you can notice here is Jesus talks about God's love and care for the creatures of the earth, but he starts with, we start with a raven. If you look back in the Bible, ravens are uh, one of the fowl that is unclean. You look in Leviticus 11, 13, and these are they which shall have an abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle and the ossifrage and the osprey and the vulture and the kite after his kind, and every raven after his kind, the unclean birds. Jesus could have made this point, any bird at all, like a clean bird. There were clean birds that they could eat, that God considered clean. 
It's in Deuteronomy 14.11 that there are clean birds to eat. So it's no accident, I think, that Jesus puts in here a raven, a bird, a fowl that is unclean. The Father takes care of these, even these unclean birds. And that's what it is, isn't it? God takes care of us when we think we're so pitiful and low. Or when the world says you're pitiful and low. And even the lost God cares for, he preserves the lives of many, and probably has done so for some of us who have tarried, given us another chance to come to him, the unclean. And we're, we're urged to be like God in that way and have, have caring and mercy on those, even, to, even on the lost. And he says in Matthew 5, 45, You may be children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. So God provides uh, a common, a common uh, blessing upon the world that even people who curse his name can partake in. Right? We don't have people that deny God going around with like a little cartoon storm cloud over their head, and there's no sun shining on them. The sun shines on them. They can have good food. They can be wealthy. They can have all manner of good things. And guess, you know, good things come from God. So he has blessings for everyone. But if you look at, at what Jesus is talking about, the raven, raven is a carrion bird. Raven is a scavenger. You'll see it uh, around here, hopping around in the parking lots of the stores, of supermarkets and things. They're scavenging for things that you and I are buying at the store. Buy like a hot dog or something at the deli. The ravens are out there looking to see if you drop a piece of your bun off, a pickle drops off of it, or something like that. But the ravens are after that, right? They, like, they eat garbage. They're smart. They're smart. They're crafty. God has given them gifts to help them. They get to a trash can. They could carry a half a hot dog, and they're being, they're being fed by God. But there is one thing you can say about a raven. There's no raven out there planting seeds, planting crops. And there's no raven sitting back at the, at the nest and going, I'm not going to find any food. I'm not even going. Or I'm going to starve. I'm not going to do anything. They go out, don't they? That's not what God has given them to do. They go out and they find food. They trust that God has food for them out there. Right? It's, they can't do anything else. That's what animals do. They trust God. And they go out and they do the work and they find the food. So God has in store for us, Jesus says, much more than these. Are you more, are you more valuable to God than a, a bird that eats garbage? It's the same for you and me, then. We just got to trust God that, that our rewards, our treasure, are all in heaven, and that's the value of them. That they belong to God. Things that belong to God, they don't rot away. They don't corrupt away. They don't rust. They don't, they're not touched by the moth, the beetle, or the locust. They cannot be corrupted. And if you cling to God, he's going to make you one of his possessions as well. And you will not corrupt. You will not go away. You will not rot away. You will not go away. You will remain forever. The things of God remain forever. So when Jesus says this, he says, you know, the, God takes care of this raven who doesn't even know about it. But God takes care of him. And he says, you're more valuable than that. If you look at verse 25, he says, you know, which of you... Taking thought can add to his stature one cubit. And he's just saying that worrying is not going to fix anything. Worrying, you never worried yourself to be into being taller. You never worried yourself into more money. You never worry yourself into um, being relaxed and calm. It's impossible. In fact, worry, is, it's dangerous, isn't it? Worry will uh, uh, cause your blood pressure to go up. It, it'll uh, shorten your life. It's in Proverbs 12, 25. The Bible talks about this. It says, Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. So the heart is, is, uh, can be damaged by worry. Then if you look in 26, Jesus goes on at this point. He says, Well, then if you, not be, if you then not be able to do that thing which is least, why take you thought for the rest? So if you cannot worry yourself even one penny richer, why are you worrying at all? Why are you worrying about other things, bigger things than that? Why am I worrying about you know, getting $1,000 for a car payment or a house payment or something like that? Why am I worrying about these things when I can't even worry myself into another penny in my pocket? It doesn't do anything. He's given us a good insight into this, and it's, it's what it is is pride. He's pointing out that 
Sometimes this worry that we have, it's pride being disguised. We are refusing to trust God for our daily bread. What we're really saying is, I don't need God to do it for me today. I can do it for myself today. I can do it all by myself today. Jesus is telling us then, look, if you say that to yourself, you're lying to yourself because you can't even provide the very smallest things in, in life. You can't provide for yourself the very tiniest things that you need. So how can you say then, I don't need God for this or that? But that's the folly of the foolish rich man that was in the parable just before this in the, in the Bible that he, he built up these storehouses for all the goods that he had. But God told him, you should have had your treasures built up in heaven. You should have put your worry and your concerns, all of your attention, rather, in your heavenly treasures. All your work and worry over this fruit harvest, it was useless. It was wasted time because that's gone. Right. You, don't, you didn't take it with you. That's gone. And you know what? It's going to go to somebody else or it's going to rot away in the storehouse. Why did you worry about it so much when you could have had your attention on the things of God that are not going away? will take with you. There are things you will take with you. So let's look in section 2 here. It's 27 through 30. Jesus is going on with the same point. He says in 27, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God, if then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven... How much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not what you shall eat or what you shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. In 20, verse 27, he says, to look at the lilies. And he knew that, and then he talks about Solomon. He knew that the, this was a Jewish audience. They knew all about the stories of Solomon, how he had such great wealth, how he was uh, made rich, how he was made powerful, how he had all the good things of the world. And um, if you look in Second Chronicles 9, 3, there's a, a good uh, testimony to this. It says, And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, his cupbearers also, and their apparel, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. So the Queen of Sheba comes to see Solomon. He sees that not only is Solomon arrayed in this fantastic outfit, even his cupbearers, even his lowliest servants have incredible, beautiful clothes on. And she says, there's no more spirit in her. She just goes, <gasps> and she's shocked at how beautiful the things in Solomon's court are. So Jesus says this is a contrast then to the vast wealth and power and beauty of this lily. And if you look at... Uh, a, a Jerusalem lily, they bloom for like a day, and then they're gone, withers away. But what they don't do is sew nice clothes for themselves. They don't have tailors and seamstresses and cupbearers. They don't have visors on how, wear your robe this way, your sash that way, it looks better. They don't, they don't have that the way Solomon did. Lilies simply are, and they are that way God wants them to be. So if we do the same thing, God promises us you're going to be splendid in all the ways that matter. Just be what God wants you to be. And it doesn't always mean you're going to have nice clothes on earth. But you are going, you're going to get, um, even if you had nice clothes and you're wearing them uh, to church every day or, or to some event, um, you might get mud on them. They might get soiled. They might get damaged. That's the earthly clothes. But we're not talking about that here. We're talking about a different garment in heaven that is for you. Look at uh, Revelation 19.14. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So if you just will be what God wants you to be, do the things he desires you to do, to the world you might look like a flower that buds and goes away. But your majesty in heaven is assured, a robe, white linen, clean, it says. And that's a robe of righteousness. A robe of righteousness for you. And that's the beauty that cannot exist on earth. More beautiful than anything on earth. And that's, I think, what Jesus is talking about. So don't worry about earthly things like that. You're more valuable to God. Look in verse 28. Are you more valuable to God than grass? I hope you're saying yes, or else you've got a you know, self-confidence problem. 
But even at your ugliest, you are more beautiful to God than this beautiful flower, this beautiful lily. He's more willing to clothe you in the robes of righteousness to out, that outshine even the most beautiful lily on earth, that outshine even Solomon's garments, that outshine uh, even uh, the things of the earth. I mean, Solomon, he probably did get mud on his clothes at some point, didn't he? But your robe of righteousness doesn't have a spot, doesn't have a blemish. Nothing that is spiritually ugly will touch you when you are in the hand of God. That's where you are right now. If you're, if you're saved, you are in the hand of God. No spiritual corruption can touch you. You're safe, you're clean. And Jesus goes on in 29, he says, Ask not, And seek not what you shall eat or what you shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. So he does say that, that a doubtful mind, that's an unfaithful mind, that's a, a mind that is looking toward earthly things, it's the same as a mind is, is worrying over, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? What am I, what am I going to pay this bill or that bill or do this or that? Right? He says that's a doubtful mind. If you look at verse 30, he says, this is, these are the kind of things that the nations of the world seek after. And we know that the nations of the world, meaning the corruption of the world, the things of the devil, they seek after these things. And these things only don't seek after spiritual things. They just worry about storing up food, storing up money, storing up uh, possessions. There are so many in the world now that that's all that they want to do. They have no concern for their spiritual well-being spiritual life, they're just looking to, to get more stuff. And that might be uh, you and me, right? We could probably look back, think about your home right now. How much stuff do we have that we don't need? It's probably 99% of it, isn't it? But those who trust God, we don't chase after the pleasures of the world. We don't look for the things that, that uh, the world tries to offer because we don't need those things. Now, we can, we can uh, have things that we want and uh, don't go home and uh, empty out your house or anything. God wants you to have good things that you don't need. He's given you those things. He's given you things that you want. But what God doesn't want you to have and won't give you is destructive things, a surplus of things that you cannot use or things that will cause you to stumble. Because sometimes people that, that focus themselves on these earthly things, they worry over the day when these things go away. These things become an idol sometimes. They get between you and God, and they, you will worship them. right? You will, you will uh, spurn God in favor of these things. And that's when it is an idol. You are worshiping that worry, even. Even if it's not a thing, a worry can be your idol. Putting your attention onto it. Giving it all of your thought all the time. Those, that's, those things go to God. And if we give them to something else all the time, that's an idol. But we know then from the promise that, that uh, you don't have to worry about anything because God, you can go to God in prayer. If you know him, you can go to God in prayer anytime over anything. Brother Jason? Sir? The, the phrase he used, O ye of little faith, that seems to be a reoccurrence. Mm -hmm. do, you know how, do, you know, do you know how many times that's actually said by Jesus? I don't know. You know. No, I don't know, but it's a lot, isn't it? I think we've read it several times in Matthew so mm -hmm. far, haven't we? Yep, yep. yep. Just curious, because it seems like it's sort of the thread that follows all the, the gospel. So That's true, yeah. He uh, uh, says it, uh, does he say it to Peter when he was sinking down? Uh, yeah. He encounters a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, Flagging faith, doesn't he? And they, as he goes along, and he calls it out. But yeah, it does happen a lot. But that's something that uh, will get in the way, I guess. The, the, the worry will get in the way. These people are worried over uh, other things. Even the Pharisees, they're worried over their social status. They're worried over their worldly status. They're worried over you know being uh, uh, seen as a, a powerful uh, individual and in, in social social structure. They worried over different things than what God wants them to worry over, and that's where they, they go wrong. And that's why Jesus has, has to teach them also, even though they're considered the, the wisest religious leaders and all the rabbis, they've, they've, they've let themselves worry about worldly concerns, and it's distracted them from God. But we can go to God. You know, God knows what you need. You know, the Bible says God knows what you need before you ask it. He knows what you need right now. He's waiting for you and me to go to him in prayer 
You know, there's, there's, there's one small concern that you have, and uh, you think, you know, um, I need to pray about this, but you just go on and don't. Well, God is waiting. God has, God has an angel ready with a, a solution for you. And he's just standing there. Come on, tap and speak. Come on, come on. Pray for it. But we don't. If you look in Daniel 9, 21, this man of faith, Daniel, his prayer is answered like that. It says in 21, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, who I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth. Give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee. For thou art greatly beloved, but therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So the, the crux of it is in 23 there. At the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth. You didn't even finish before God started to answer your prayer. That's how fast it will happen. Because he already knows. He already had Gabriel locked and loaded. He was fired out the cannon as soon as Daniel hit his knees. He's ready. This next section is Jesus talking about the kingdom then. Hope we shall focus our, our attention. And that's on the kingdom of God and the things of God. Look in 1231 through 34. It says, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old. Treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. But verse 31 says, Rather seek ye the kingdom of God. It is a choice. Things of the world, the kingdom of God. Things of the earth, things of God. Rather that means there's a choice. There's a one or the other. You can't have both. You cannot worship God and mammon. You cannot do both. You will hate the one and love the other. So you've got to put your attention on the things of God and love the things of God. And he says, fear not, in 32, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He says little flock there because he, he's the good shepherd. right? He's, you, we're his sheep. He says little flock. And this, this word... Um, if you look, this is another one that I should have uh, probably looked up, but fear not. Just like Brother Brad was talking about the uh, ye of little faith, fear not is everywhere in the Bible, isn't it? Yeah. God is constantly saying, don't worry about that. Do not be concerned about that. Do not run back and forth about all these things. I've got it in hand. He says, fear not. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And that's something that we should uh, understand. Sometimes we get into this mindset of like, um, you know, oh, God is mad at me because of what I did. No. God is, God is uh, waiting to give you the kingdom. God is ready to give you the kingdom. It is his good pleasure. If you come to his altar, if you accept Jesus Christ, he's pleased. And he willingly and lovingly and joyfully will give you the kingdom. It's his good pleasure pleases God for you to have the good things of God, for you to ask him for the good things that you need. And he says in 33 then, sell that you have and give alms, provide yourselves bags which whack not old, a treasure in heaven that faileth not. And he says then what we've been talking about, that, that this, this, these goods that you have, these, these possessions that we have, it's okay to have those things. But Jesus, when he says sell what you have, what he means is that be willing to get, get, let go of it. Right? If Jesus says, if, if it gets in between you and God and, and Jesus needs you to get rid of it, get rid of it. If you find yourself focusing your time and your, your attention on some possession that you have or some earthly concern that you have, get rid of it. And that's what he means. Just turn your attention to something better. And he says give alms. That's the thing, that's the concern of God, to help others. He says, take your attention off these worldly things, put them on godly things, and what will you do? You'll provide yourself bags, which wax not old, bags of treasure, bags of goodwill, bags of rewards in heaven. And he says, everything that, that um, heaven promises you, no thief approaches, no moth corrupts, they don't fail, they go on forever, they don't get used up, your treasure in heaven doesn't diminish over time, 
Treasure in heaven remains. Treasure in heaven is not like anything on earth. And sometimes it's hard for us to understand that because things on earth, we don't know anything on earth that doesn't go away. Everything on earth goes away. Everything that we have, it does get corrupted, doesn't it? It does rust away. It does break. It does fall apart. That's just the nature of the world. That's what sin has done to the world. It corrupts it. causes everything to break apart. But there is no such thing in heaven. So if we put our rewards in heaven, their sin cannot touch them. And the corruption of sin will not break them apart. The corruption of sin will not cause the, the, you know, the door of your mansion to fall off when you get in heaven. No such thing. The foundation will not be cracked. It's going to be perfectly clean. Those, the streets of gold, perfectly transparent gold. And those gems that are in the that line all of the walls of the city, they don't, none of them are going to fall out. And you have to pitch, reach down and pick them up like we do on earth. They're perfect. They're untouched. They do not corrupt. It's all in God's hands. It says finally in verse 34, then, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And that's really the big, big point of it. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So where we, where we focus ourselves day by day, that's where our heart is. That's where our concern is. That's where that, Those are the things we love. So what do I focus on day by day? Is it the things that I love that are on earth, the things that I love in heaven? Is it the things that I love on earth? Or the things that, that, that God tells me that I need to be doing, the things that I need to put my attention on. And you can have things on earth that you, that you are fond of, things that you like to keep, keepsakes or, or possessions that you enjoy using, but don't let your attention go on those, because if your heart becomes committed to those, again, they are an idol. And it says it here, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And that's your heart, that's your attention, that's your devotion, that's, that's what you are uh, really just worshiping. And he says, if you're, what are you worshiping? You're worshiping something on earth, giving it all your attention, all your, all your thought, and ignoring the things that God needs you to be doing. When, if you turn your minds to God, let go of all that, give it to Him, you'll have a better time of it. Your worry will go away. God will help you take care of this, and your treasure in heaven will increase because you'll be doing the things of God and laying up treasures in heaven. And that's where we need to keep, keep your heart in heaven. Keep your heart on heavenly things. And that's reading your Bible, doing the things that God has said, God has put down in his word, and keep your mind on that. And that's the best way to do it, is just keep reading. Keep reading. And if we get distracted on something else, you know, there's, there's a... Uh, <clears throat> you can always have a Bible nearby. Just uh, stop yourself. I'm getting worried about this. Go read the Bible. You'll find a solution somewhere. At least you'll find calm. At least you'll find a way to Turn your attention to a godly thing, and then you'll let go of that worry. Right. It will help you. And that's a blessing from God that we have that. And uh, let's use it. So this, this final uh, uh, message that Jesus gives and, and that is in our, um, is in our uh, lesson, the main point of our lesson, is faith displaces worry. One displaces the other. They push each other out. If you have faith, your worry is pushed out. If you, have, if you have worry, your faith gets pushed away. You can't have both at the same place. So take, take faith in God, push out that worry, and don't give it any place to come back. Don't leave any space for it. Leave your mind on God, and God will take away that worry from you. Let's pray. We'll finish there. Lord God, we're again so thankful for this day, thankful to be able to come together to study your word. We pray, Father, that uh, your uh, will has been done here today, and we pray, Father, that all those who are here have been blessed, and something good has come out of this for you, for you and for them. And we ask, Father, that today you will be with us through the rest of the service, be with the song leaders as they lead us in song, be with Brother Bill as he brings some message. We pray, Father, that you will lift him up, give him the strength, give him the understanding that he needs to say exactly what we need to hear today, to strengthen us and Give us the faith and, and chase away those worries of the world that try to, to get in and, and disturb our, our peace with you. And we ask that you will just be with us through the rest of the day, be with us through our lives, Father. And when we come to you and ask, we understand, Father, that you are ready to answer our prayer. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.